In this segment, we're going to talk about a new problem, the minimum spanning tree problem. This is a graph problem with practical significance. And indeed, it was studied very early on, as early as 1926, because of its practical relevance. Let's get into it and define what the minimum spanning tree problem is. For this video, we're going to talk about undirected and weighted graphs. Also for this video, we are just going to work with connected graphs. So we will always assume that our input graph is connected. Let's start out by defining a spanning tree. A spanning tree of a connected graph G is a subgraph that first of all is a tree and second of all contains all the vertices of G. In other words, it is a tree that connects all of the vertices of G. So here's an example of a spanning tree for this unweighted grid graph. This is actually the spanning tree that we found by Brett First Search in the last video. So you see that the red edges here form a tree and they connect all of the vertices of the graph. If we have an unweighted graph, then we can find a spanning tree of the graph either by depth first search or breadth first search. We can do this by keeping track of the edge to relation. That is, for each vertex v, we remember the name of the vertex from which we first visited v. If the original graph is connected, this edge to relation will define a spanning tree. This shows that we can find a spanning tree in an unweighted graph an unweighted connected graph in time of order the number of edges. In the last video, we also saw that breadth first search can give us a special kind of spanning tree called a shortest path tree. For example, the spanning tree in this picture here, the red edges in the picture, they show shortest paths from vertex zero because this tree resulted from doing breadth first search starting at vertex zero. So you can follow the red edges to find the shortest path from vertex zero to any other vertex in this graph. So in this segment, we're going to talk about finding a spanning tree with a different goal in mind. We want to find a spanning tree of a graph such that the sum of the weights of the edges in the tree is as small as possible. So a tree realizing this is called a minimum spanning tree. And I will also abbreviate a minimum spanning tree as an MST. So here's a motivating example for the minimum spanning tree problem. So here we have a map of Australia, and we have the cities of Perth, Darwin, Cairns, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and Hobart. And let's say that we want to connect all these cities together by a cable network. And now the edges of the graph show the possible routes where we can lay the cable together with the length in kilometers of the cable that is needed for that route. Now what we want to do is choose a subset of these possible routes, so a subset of the edges that connect all of the cities together and that use the least amount of cable possible. A set of edges that connect all the cities using the least amount of cable is exactly a minimum spanning tree of the graph in the picture. So this is some motivation for the minimum spanning tree problem. The edges in red here show a minimum spanning tree in this example. So you can see that the red edges form a tree, there are no cycles, and they connect all the cities. In this case, you actually need 9,280 kilometers of cable to link all these cities. Okay, so let's get our bearings with the unweighted case where the weight of every edge is one. So here's a question for you. What is the total weight that is the sum of all the edge weights of a minimum spanning tree and an unweighted connected graph with n vertices? Well, we know that any spanning tree has exactly n minus one edges. So if every edge has weight one, the total weight of a minimum spanning tree is going to be n minus one. And in fact, in the unweighted case, any spanning tree is going to be a minimum spanning tree. They're all going to have weight 
n minus 1. So as we've already mentioned, in the unweighted case, you can find a minimum spanning tree either with depth first search or breadth first search. OK, so now let's move on to the case of a weighted graph. We're actually going to assume that no two edge weights compare as equal. So we can actually always ensure this just by slightly changing our comparison function. When two edges have the same weight, we can break the tie and edge weight between them by also taking into account their endpoints. So one way you can do this is shown here in the picture. And I've taken this picture from chapter seven, section one of a book called Algorithms by Jeff Erickson. And this is a really nice book, and I encourage you to check out its section on the minimum spanning tree problem. The nice thing about doing this, about assuming that no two edges have equal weights, is that it implies that the minimum spanning tree is unique. OK, so we're actually going to assume this for our presentation, that no two edge weights compare as equal. OK, now let's get into how to actually compute a minimum spanning tree. And from my point of view, the key to the whole business is thinking about a notion called a cut. A cut is a subset of edges of a graph. And a cut is defined by a non-empty subset of vertices. Usually, I'm going to refer to this set of vertices as S. <clears throat> The cut defined by the subset S is exactly the set of edges that have one endpoint in S. OK, so I've, I've given some examples here for, for different subsets S. And in each case, the edges in the cut are shown in red. And so you see that in each case, uh, we have a subset S of vertices, which is you know, shown by the blue oval. And the cut defined by that subset is exactly is the set of edges that have exactly one endpoint in S. So they have one endpoint in S and one endpoint not in S. So a key fact about a cut is that if we remove all the edges in a cut, then this will disconnect the graph. So once we remove the edges from a cut defined by a set S, then there is no longer any edge between a vertex in S and a vertex not in S. So you can see that in the picture here. I have the red edges on the left are the edges in the cut defined by S. When I remove those edges, then the graph becomes disconnected. So this fact is going to be key to our use of cuts uh, in arguing about minimum spanning trees. OK, so now we come to our first key fact about spanning trees. A spanning tree must contain an edge from every cut. So if there was a cut defined by a set S and the spanning tree did not contain any edges from this cut, then the spanning tree would not have any edge from a vertex in S to a vertex not in S. Therefore, it could not be a spanning tree. right? It would not even be a connected graph and it could not connect all the vertices of the graph. So that gives us fact one. A spanning tree must contain an edge from every cut. So here's just a little illustration of fact one. On the right, we have an example spanning tree of this graph shown by the blue edges. And we see that this spanning tree contains one of the red edges on the left, the edges in the cut defined by the set S. So this is just one example, but you can play around with this. And you see that any cut that you take in this graph, one of the blue edges must be in that cut. Now we're going to leverage fact one into a fact about minimum spanning trees. That is the basis of every algorithm for finding a minimum spanning tree. And I phrase this in fact two. Fact two says that a minimum spanning tree must contain the minimum weight edge from every cut. So fact one says that 
For every cut, a spanning tree must contain at least one edge from that cut. And fact two says that if we actually have a minimum spanning tree, then we know which edge, we know an edge that it must contain in every cut. So for every cut, a minimum spanning tree must contain the least weight edge in that cut. Remember again that we assume that no two edge weights compare as equal. So this minimum weight edge in a cut is actually unique. And we can use this fact too to help us build up a minimum spanning tree, one edge at a time. But first let's see why fact two is true. So to illustrate fact two, we're going to consider this example. <clears throat> so I have a graph in the picture here and you should think of this as a weighted graph. So the thickness of the edge is supposed to indicate the weight of that edge. The thicker the edge, the heavier the weight. So the set in blue defines a cut that contains three edges. And I've shown those three edges in red here. Now we know that any spanning tree of this graph has to contain at least one of the red edges by fact one. Let us suppose for a contradiction that we have a minimum spanning tree in this graph that does not contain the minimum weight edge of this cut. The minimum weight edge in this cut is this thin red edge at the very bottom. Okay, so here in green, I've shown a spanning tree and we're going to suppose for a contradiction that this is a minimum weight uh, spanning tree and that it does not contain this minimum weight edge of the cut defined by the set of vertices given by the blue oval. So we're going to arrive at a contradiction to this being a minimum weight spanning tree by coming up with another spanning tree whose total weight is smaller. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add to my set of green edges the minimum weight edge of this cut. Okay, so this thin uh, edge at the, at the bottom where the blue arrow is pointing. So when I add this edge to my spanning tree, it must create a cycle. Okay, and we can see from this example that we've actually created a cycle here. So I've, I've drawn the cycle here in red. And now this cycle, it must have another edge in the cut. Okay, it must have another edge in the cut besides our minimum weight edge. If it did not, then it could not be a cycle. And since we know that this bottom edge where the blue arrow is pointing is the minimum weight edge in the cut, this other edge in the cycle that is also part of the cut must have larger weight than our minimum weight edge. So this means that we can obtain a spanning tree with less overall weight by taking this other edge out and leaving the minimum weight edge in. Okay, so that's what I've done now. I've taken the top edge that is part of the cut out of the spanning tree and I've added in the minimum weight edge. So you see that now the green edges again form a spanning tree and this spanning tree has less overall weight than the original spanning tree because the weight of the minimum weight edge is less than the weight of this other edge from the cut that we had in the spanning tree before. So now we've reached a contradiction and this shows fact two. A minimum spanning tree must contain the minimum weight edge from every cut. Okay, so now we've established fact two. Let's see how we can use fact two to actually build a minimum weight spanning tree. The first minimum spanning tree algorithm that we're going to look at is called Prim's algorithm. So in Prim's algorithm, we start at an arbitrary vertex. So we're back to our, our example with these cities in Australia. And let's say that we start in Perth. Now look at the cut defined by Perth. So there are two edges in this cut, which I highlight in red here. One of these edges has weight 2600 
and the other has weight 3600. So by fact two, we know that the smaller weight edge here must be part of the minimum spanning tree. So we add this edge, the edge of weight 2600 between Perth and Darwin, as the first edge of the minimum spanning tree that we're building. Okay, so here I've added this edge and, and made it green. So the green edges are going to represent this minimum spanning tree that we're building up in our algorithm. So now we actually have a tree on the cities, Perth and Darwin. And now we consider the cut defined by Perth and Darwin. So there are three edges in this cut shown in red here. And these edges have weight 3,600, 3,000, and 2,800. So by fact two, again, we know that the smallest weight edge, the edge with weight 2,800 between Darwin and Brisbane must be part of the minimum spanning tree. So now we can add this edge to the tree that we're building. Okay, so now I've made this edge green and now we've constructed a minimum spanning tree on the cities of Perth, Darwin, and Brisbane. Okay, so we're now going to repeat exactly the same process. We consider the cut defined by Perth, Darwin, and Brisbane. So this cut has four edges. And now the minimum weight edge in this cut is the edge between Brisbane and Sydney and that edge has weight 900. So we add this edge to our tree next. Okay, so now I've shown that edge in green, and now we have a minimum spanning tree on the cities of Perth, Darwin, Brisbane, and Sydney. And we just keep repeating this process. So now we consider the cut defined by Perth, Darwin, Brisbane, and Sydney. This cut actually has six edges, and the minimum weight edge in this cut is the edge between Sydney and Melbourne, which has weight 880. So we're going to add this edge to our tree next. Okay, so now I've drawn that edge in green. And I think you're seeing the idea now, so I'm just going to speed up. So now we have a tree on the cities of Perth, Darwin, Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne. And the minimum weight edge in the cut defined by these cities is actually the edge of weight 700 between Melbourne and Hobart. So I'm going to add that edge to our tree. So I've done, done that now. And now the only thing that we're missing, the only city that we're missing is Cairns. So now we add the minimum weight edge between Cairns and uh, the rest of our green tree, which is the edge between Brisbane and Cairns of weight 1400. So now the green edges give a spanning tree on all the cities. And this tree is a minimum spanning tree because we know that every edge that we added has to be part of the minimum spanning tree because of fact two. Okay, so fact two has guaranteed that every edge that we added is part of the minimum spanning tree. So at the end, we must have found the minimum spanning tree. Okay, so let's step back from this example and go over Prim's algorithm in general at a high level. So the invariant in Prim's algorithm is that we always maintain a minimum spanning tree on a subset S of the vertices. Initially, S is just a single vertex and the tree has no edges. And in each round of the algorithm, we add a single edge to our tree and the size of S increases by one. And the edge that we add in this round of the algorithm is the minimum weight edge in the cut defined by our current set S. This minimum weight edge is guaranteed to be part of the minimum spanning tree by fact two. So we just keep repeating this process for N minus one rounds. And after N minus one rounds, the set S becomes the set of all the vertices and we have a minimum spanning tree on all of the vertices. Okay, so hopefully this high level idea of Prim's algorithm is clear. Now let's get more into the details of how to actually implement it in code. 
The key algorithmic primitive we need to implement Prim's algorithm is to find the minimum weight edge in the cut defined by a set S. So this is the key operation that we do in each round of the algorithm. To perform this operation, we are going to use a minimum priority queue holding edges. So every time we add a vertex to S, we add all of its incident edges in the cut defined by S to the priority queue. We do not need to add any edges of this new vertex where the other endpoint is already in S. Such an edge cannot be part of the minimum spanning tree because adding it to the tree that we've already built would create a cycle. So we only add to the priority queue the edges from this new vertex who, where the other endpoint is not in S. So now to find the minimum weight edge in the cut defined by S, we look at the top item in the priority queue and we pop it out of the queue. So this will give us the minimum weight edge in the priority queue. Now this edge could have been added to the priority queue at a much earlier stage of the algorithm. So it may no longer be part of the current cut that we are considering. What I mean is that this edge might have both its endpoints inside S. If this is the case, then we just ignore this edge and keep going. So we pop the next edge out of the pri priority queue, etc., until we find an edge that is in the cut defined by our current set S. This edge must then be the minimum weight edge in the cut defined by S, and we can add this edge to the tree that we're building. The reason why we call this algorithm lazy is this property that the minimum priority queue contains edges that are no longer relevant for us. We do not clean up the queue as we go. So in other words, we do not remove edges from the queue at the moment that they become irrelevant for us. You can modify the algorithm to do this, which gives what's called an eager version of Prim's algorithm but we're not going to talk about that implementation of Prim's algorithm. To do that implementation, you actually need something more than a standard priority queue in order to implement it. Okay, so I'm not going to give you the actual code for a lazy implementation of Prim's algorithm, as this is going to be an exercise in the lab session. I will show you a bit of pseudocode though, so that we can properly analyze the running time of the algorithm. So here's some pseudocode for a lazy version of Prim's algorithm. We have a graph class, and our function is going to return the minimum spanning tree as a graph object. We have a minimum priority queue that's going to hold edges, and we call this edge queue. So we start at vertex zero, and we add all the edges incident to vertex zero to the edge queue. As in depth first and breadth first search, we're going to have an array of Booleans called marked, which is initialized to be everywhere false. The set of vertices that are marked is going to represent the, the set S in the algorithm, the set on which we have already built a minimum spanning tree. So initially we set the vertex zero to be marked. So the main body of the function is a while loop that's going to pop edges out of the priority queue until the queue becomes empty. When we take the top edge of the priority queue, let's call it min weight edge, we check if this edge is still relevant for, relevant for us. So that's what's done in the highlighted if statement here. This if statement is checking if the min weight edge is in the cut defined by the marked vertices. So it's checking if exactly one of the endpoints of the edge is marked. So if not, then the edge is not relevant for us and we just ignore it. Otherwise, we add this edge to the MST tree that we're building and we mark the new endpoint of this edge called vertex to add here. We then push all the edges 
incident to vertex to add that are in the cut defined by the marked vertices to the priority queue. Let us now analyze the running time of this algorithm. The first key claim is that we push at most the number of edges in the graph to the priority queue. That is, we push each edge to the priority queue at most once. When we push an edge to the priority queue, one of its endpoints must be marked. Thus, when we encounter this edge again by its other endpoint, it will not be added to the priority queue because at that point, both of its endpoints will be marked. So each edge is pushed to the priority queue at most once. So this means that at all times, the size of the priority queue is at most the number of edges. We know that push and pop operations on a priority queue take time logarithmic in its size. So this means that all our push, push and pop operations can be done in time order log the number of edges. Now let's go back to our pseudocode and look at the total time spent doing the pop operation. As we only push to the queue at most the number of edges many times, the total number of iterations of the while loop is at most the number of edges. So this upper bounds the number of times that we pop, and the total time spent popping is at most the number of edges times the logarithm of the number of edges. The other main operation that we do in the algorithm is pushing edges into the priority queue. So we do this by iterating over the edges incident to a vertex and pushing those edges that are still relevant, that is, those edges that are in the current cut defined by the marked vertices. In the adjacency list model, we can iterate over all the edges incident to a given vertex in time proportional to the degree of that vertex. Thus, the time to push the relevant edges into the queue will be proportional to the degree times log of the number of edges. That's the time that it takes us to push. So we will only do this operation on a vertex at most once. So the total time spent on all the push operations is going to be of the order the number of edges times the logarithm of the number of edges. This means that both of our main operations in the algorithm take time of the order the number of edges times the logarithm of the number of edges. And so the overall running time is order the number of edges times the logarithm of the number of edges in the adjacency list model. We can equivalently say that the running time is order the number of edges times log, log n, where n is the number of vertices because the number of edges is always at most n squared, and so log of the number of edges is order log n. So, so you'll also see the running time of Prim's algorithm stated in this way, as, the, as order the number of edges times log n. So this running time is nearly optimal, because we know that you have to spend at least time proportional to the number of edges to find a minimum spanning tree. Indeed, you have to spend at least this much time just to find the minimum weight edge, because to find the minimum weight edge, you might need to scan over all of the edges. So we see that Prim's algorithm finds a minimum weight spanning tree and does so in a running time that is optimal up to this factor of log n.